Um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Chris Grimsire, who is an anthropologist who, whose career has really been formed, even in its early graduate stages, at the University of Pretoria. He's a pre University of Pretoria man through and through. Um, he did his PhD on Sangha and customary law, and he's done a lot of work on community and heritage and tourism um, within this, particularly within the South African context since then. Um, he's also been responsible for the university's heritage and tourism course, which has been running in various permutations and which has actually allowed me on to teaching, which is very kind of him, since 1997. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Chris, who will be speaking about the role of traditional knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Yeah, thank you for all the kind words, uh, uh, Brett, and, uh, but also allow me the, the opportunity to thank you as well as um, Marie -Louis, Louise, uh, Mari, the other Mari, and then also Leanne Philpot for all the arrangements and so on, and also <coughs> for getting me here at this conference. It's a great privilege and so on, and uh, really I feel myself actually as the sheep in the goat crawl, like that here in the scene and presence of all the experts on this topic of, of heritage. Uh, so yesterday we all had the honor to listen to well-prepared papers and so on, and some concepts uh, that uh, were discussed and so on, uh, such as heritage and so on. So I'm not going to uh, dwell on those uh, concepts again, but maybe just to refer to it and just to continue, not trying not to waste unnecessary time. Uh, I apologize that I'm going to read this, but I have no choice uh, since I want to get through with it. Uh, it's quite a long paper. Uh, when I prepared it, it was actually double the length that it will be today. So I want just to save you and try to make it in 40 minutes uh, time. Um, just to start with, how do I get this thing going? Because the, the way in which South Africa has hit the international headlines recently with the controversy raised by the removal of the statue of Cecil John Rhodes talks directly to issues of tangible heritage. In particular, it raises questions about the intangible meanings which forms part of a group's traditional knowledge. Attached to tangible ob objects, statues such as the one of Rhodes is often erected not only to commemorate a person, but also to commemorate past events and to reinforce it. And then I quote from um, Geoffroy uh, the, uh, when he says that to reinforce the social cohesion of community or good relations between two or more communities, which manifests itself through a collective and symbolic effort to conserve a property that carries important values. The controversy raised by the removal of the road statue is a clear indication that different values and perceptions of particular statues based on different knowledge systems can be responsible for weakening social cohesion instead of reinforcing it. In the case of South Africa, it also raises questions about its national vision of nation building. And eventually, I'll come back to this point. What is at stake here is the way in which ordinary people in group context make sense of the tangible heritage around them. Ordinary people in group context give meaning to places and objects based on social values, beliefs, sentiments, motivations, and feelings. In the living world of indigenous peoples, such meanings form part of the collective memory of a people and transfer from one generation to the next. However, such meanings are not static, but are interpreted and reinterpreted by each successive generation. Hence, tangible heritage, which includes statues, is endowed with meaning, which may differ from one group to another and may be signified with new meaning by different groups and generations. When we seek to understand the collective meaning of tangible or built heritage, we actually seek to gain access to this local or traditional knowledge in order to conserve, manage, and sustain built heritage, not only for its self-evident meaning, but for the meanings attached to it by local people. Hence, this, people, this paper will give particular attention to the concept of traditional knowledge and its applicability for the management 
and sustainability of built heritage. Question is, what is traditional knowledge? Trying to sort that out. Literature suggests different types of knowledge, but without a deliberate attempt to make a clear distinction between them. And then there are different names and so on. I'm not going to embroider on that. But I want to continue by saying neither is any uh, clear distinction made between the names indigenous knowledge, traditional knowledge, and local knowledge. And since the term traditional knowledge has become generally preferred and applied in contemporary liter literature, um, it will be used in this paper, but with the understanding that it refers to cultural communities and taking into consideration that no cultural community lives in isolation but is influenced by others. According to Somali and Kinshilo, traditional knowledge relates to any knowledge held collectively by a population based on their interpretation of their immediate world and their understanding of themselves in relation to their natural and cultural environment and how they organize it in order to enhance their daily lives and livelihoods. However, many academics who have studied traditional knowledge agree that it is almost impossible to provide a precise universal def definition. Baptiste and Henderson caution against the tendency to regard traditional knowledge as a uniform concept, of, um, as a uniform concept across all indigenous peoples. It is a diverse knowledge that is spread throughout different peoples in many layers. Furthermore, although it can be accepted that traditional knowledge is defined in relation to indigenous peoples, also a concept that was discussed yesterday, the question may still be asked, when does knowledge become traditional or not traditional? Science, for example, could be a body of knowledge that is defined as non-traditional. But scientific knowledge becomes traditional knowledge under certain circumstances. This problematized the notion of traditional knowledge somewhat. According to the proponents of scientific knowledge, science is science, regardless of the cultural context in which it is practiced or learned or taught. They argue that science is culturally neutral in contrast with traditional knowledge systems which are characterized by cultural values, beliefs, and practices. Traditional knowledge is inextricably linked to culture, while issues such as culture, ethnicity, and place confine and define it. Hence, traditional knowledge is specific to a particular cultural group. If it means everything, then it means nothing. <clears throat> Another topic the relation of worldviews to systems of logical values. Attempts in the colonial past to define traditional knowledge bear a strong Eurocentric character, since it reflects an outsider interpretation and perspective, rather than an insider emic reflection of what indigenous peoples know and how they think. In the same vein, Eurocentric science does not form part of indigenous thought processes. Traditional knowledges do not correspond with Western ideas of classification and the rational and objective perception of reality. Traditional knowledge systems are intertwined with the worldviews and epistemologies obtained by indigenous peoples through life experience and transferred, usually orally, from one generation to another. In many traditional knowledge systems, the Eurocentric epistemology of studying, knowing, and eventually mastering and subsequently dominating the world seems totally out of place, as it is apparently absolute ignorant of the sacred kinship between humans and other creations of nature. From the perspective of many indigenous peoples, Western science is grounded upon aggressive epistemology that seeks to appropriate the earth, the main goal being to control nature and manipulate it to serve human needs. On the contrary, Indigen indigenous epistemologies are, as a rule, not uncomfortable with a lack of certainty about the social world, the spiritual world, and the world of nature. For many indigenous peoples have no need to solve all the mysteries about the world they operate with and in. In this belief, such indigenous groups are expressing both an epistemological and ontological dynamic, a way of knowing and being that is relational. The Western scientific 
epistemological concept of knowing does not necessarily match the indigenous context. The indigenous connection with the world around them is not as much an expression of knowing as much as it is one of relating. In the true sense of holism, this relation to no nature often has a spiritual dimension. The spiritual dimension has particular implications for the sustainability of tangible heritage. The words of Bernie are of particular significance when he says that conservation solutions that fail to mesh with local beliefs and practices are not solutions at all. As such, traditional knowledge should not be framed as a resource but to be, ex to be exploited, but as a perspective that can help change the conscious the consciousness of Western academics and their students. Something about traditional knowledge and essentialism. I have to cut here on essentialism, but I want to say this about it. There is an inherent tendency to get entrapped into essentialism in the study of traditional knowledge. I think also we touched upon that this yesterday. However, all cultures are always in a state of constant change, so that any study of traditional knowledge in the academy must allow for its evolution and ever-changing relationship to Eurocentric scientific and educational practice. In this increasingly globalized world, transnational population movements and multinational capital infusions disrupt traditional cultural systems. In other words, people's knowledge is never exclusively local but re results from complex negotiating practices linked to knowledge interfaces. Care should therefore be taken not to approach traditional knowledge as indisputably local or endogenous, but rather indicate how local people regularly experiment with exogenous elements to expand their own wealth of knowledge. So, but uh, saying that, there is an interesting dynamic that has developed recently. Whilst anthropologists are busy deconstructing essentialist <coughs> ideas of peoples and cultures, the people themselves on the ground are busy re-essentializing themselves. The rapid revival of culture globally, I, refer, I can refer here to the work of Barbara Uman, also a legal anthropologist, has seen a rise in first peoples all over the globe from Australian Aborigines, Native Americans, Amazonian groups, etc., who need to be seen as essentialist group with a culture, and then by extension also traditional knowledge, in order to make claims to resources such as land or to fight legally for compensation for historical redress. So what position should we take here? Do we support the essentializing tendencies of traditional groups? with their best interests at heart, or do we continue with the intellectual thrust towards deconstruct, uh, deconstructing essentialisms in terms of history and politics, or is there a middle way here? <laughs> I can't answer that one, but I'll put it to you. Um, something about the production of traditional knowledge question is, how is knowledge produced in an indigenous community? Further, how do implicit worldviews shape the knowledge construction process? There is an increasing recognition that what is important in studying traditional knowledge is not so much bodies of facts, but the issue of how things are known rather than what things are known. Traditional knowledge is in the first instance the result of the daily interactions in the indigenous people's territories. Traditional knowledge is immersed in the whole culture and is recreated through generations. Secondly, there are also non-local or non-indigenous <coughs> factors that influence the recreation of local traditional knowledge. These factors include such phenomena as indigenous responses to technological market and state innovations. For example, in northern Ghana, the Nankani women's tradition of unique, sophisticated and high techni technical knowledge of the utilization of indigenous materials has been replaced due to modern influences by the introduction of new building materials and techniques, such as the use of cement or coal tar, coal tar plaster 
and corrugated metal roofing sheets, together with more rectangular built structures. And this same thing is also happening in South Africa. I'm going to cut there, just make this the point. Um, the relation between traditional knowledge, heritage, and intangible cultural heritage. Here I'm trying to get, um, bring these uh, concepts together. According to Batiste and Henderson, heritage includes, again with <laughs> the concept of heritage yesterday uh, quite thoroughly discussed, includes all those things that international law regards as the creative production of human thought and craftsman, craftsmanship such as songs, stories, then knowledge, and artworks, the intangibles, as well as inheritance, inheritances from the past and from nature, such as and those referring to the tangibles. I'm not going on with that one. But this important, this, this, this description is more, almost completely in concurrence with Articles 11 and 12 of the Principles and Guidelines for the Protection of the Heritage of Indigenous Peoples accepted by UNESCO in 1995. And I think you are more familiar with that than me, so I'm leaving it there. But from these descriptions, the point that I want to make is that knowledge of Indigenous Peoples clearly is a key component of intangible cultural heritage. It is important to note that the divide between tangible and intangible heritage is a Western concept and that it is not supported by any Afri particular African worldview that I'm familiar with. And I think also you, Len, you will continue with this later on. In the latter instance, tangible cultural heritage acquires significance by means of the intangible meanings attached to it in group contexts. These intangible meanings form part of a group's traditional knowledge system, since it is only those with the knowledge um, who are able to make them and to read them. Sharing of this knowledge creates a feeling of belonging and stimulates group identity. In this context, it is important to know that although heritage is associated with the past and in fact draws on tradition, it does not need to be old does not need to be old. Culture changes continuously, and as such, heritage is created on a daily basis, but with links to the past. Hence, Harrison and Rose talks of living heritage, and consider the role of heritage in the production of the present for the future. Under these conditions, there is, a, is as a rule, little sense of past, present, and future, which implies that what is regarded as heritage is in fact a state of mind. The question that arises is how do you preserve a state of mind in a tangible sense? I think the answer is simple. As an anthropologist, I say you have to preserve the people. UNESCO defines intangible cultural heritage as the practices, representations, expressions, knowledge, skills as well as the instruments, objects, artifacts, and cultural spaces associated therewith that communities, groups, and in some cases, individuals recognize as part of their cultural heritage. This definition implies that in intangible cultural heritage, just like in traditional knowledge systems, all aspects of the universe are interrelated and that traditional knowledge is holistic, relational, and spiritual. This traditional view implies that intangible cultural heritage cannot be reduced to an inventory of objects without marginalizing, marginalizing it, its most important features. Not only social meanings, but also religious meanings are normally attached to built structures, natural features, and spaces. <clears throat> Who owns intangible cultural heritage? This question is important since one would reason that the responsibility for the safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage is directly linked to ownership. However, the issue of ownership is not explicitly addressed in the UNESCO Convention. The fact that its Intergovernmental Committee for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage is comprised of representatives of state parties is probably the main reason why the safeguarding of the intangible cultural heritage is primarily a national responsibility. According to this convention, 
It is the responsibility of each state party to draw up an inventory of the intangible cultural heritage present in its territory with the participation of communities, groups and relevant non-governmental organisations. There are a number of shortfalls, but I'll give you another one uh, of, the, of the Convention, and that is that it provides only selective protection at the international level through the mechanism of the representative list of the intangible heritage of humanity. Usually no information about UN treaties and their processes are given down to the indigenous peoples. Even though these instruments are directly relevant to their interests, it is very important that indigenous peoples, by means of their representative bodies and the support of their national governments, get direct represent representation in these processes and procedures. At present, it appears that the representative bodies of indigenous peoples are only able to apply for observer status with no voting competency in meetings held under the Convention. Furthermore, at, uh, at local level, um, European legal praxis is often incapable of recognizing the powerful relationships and often accompanying tensions that inform ownership, control, and meaning of intangible cultural heritage in indigenous <coughs> political and cultural arenas. Bunza's study in the low felt region of the Limpopo province of South Africa illustrates this point. Um, this is about a, a traditional leader, and he actually wanted to set aside part of his um, area of jurisdiction for uh, the establishment of a game reserve, a game ranch actually for trophy hunting eventually, and it had the potential to be linked, with, uh, uh, to, be linked to Kruger National Park. But in the, uh, I'll call him the dominant traditional leader. And my, the point that I want to make is that this, uh, these type of leaders can uh, m uh, sometimes be the most prominent stumbling block in promoting community participation and the conservation of a heritage site. In this case, more specifically, a religious site. Uh, this traditional leader did not consider the concerns of the cattle, owner, uh, cattle owners who grazed their cattle in the specific land nor those of the women who ex extracted salt from the soil surrounding the hot springs situated in the center of the game reserve that he proposed. And uh, this hot spring is apparently the last unspoiled hot spring in South Africa. And that would uh, form part of his proposed uh, nature of game ranch. Apart from the fact that the women depend on the salt to supplement their income, it is also a religious site, as I said, with particular religious prescriptions and taboos attached to it. In addition, an EIA suggested that to make the proposed game reserve ecologically viable, it had to be extended to include part of the area administered by the neighboring chief. So when I approached the dominant chief, his first words to me were, who is going to be in charge? In view of the way in which the dominant traditional leader took advantage of his power by ignoring his subjects' interests, one agrees with Blake that participation of the community may help to prevent traditional community leaders to establish power relations or capture resources intended for the whole community for themselves. Determining ownership. Guys, I think I, there's the spring, sorry, I forgot to show that. Unfortunately, it's just a white and, and black one, but that's the hot spring, just to give you an indication. Um, <coughs> determining ownership is important to provide the necessary uh, support for the maintenance of heritage, whether it be funding, education, or any other external support. It has to be determined in accordance with indigenous people's own customs, laws, and practices. In this regard, referring to African model law, Ferris concludes that traditional knowledge and practices are intellectual community rights, and that these rights should be recognized and protected under the norms and practices of customary law. He continues, but I'm going to leave it there. The traditional ownership may vest, we spoke about it earlier also, who owns intangible cultural heritage? That was the question. Now, again, back to ownership. The traditional ownership may vest in the whole people. 
a particular family or clan, an association or society, or individuals who have been specially taught or initiated to be its custodians. And then to my slide, the ritual hut of Sosobala in Niagasolo, Guinea, serves as an illustration of, in, of effective heritage conservation by a family responsible for the maintenance and the support of the state. <coughs> the Sosobala hut lies in the area of the Kuyati family, who is responsible <coughs> for its maintenance. The conservation of the Sosobala hut, a uh, ritual hut, it's a ritual hut, is characterized by protective rights and values associated with the ancestral culture of the Dokala Kuyati family. A guardian protects the ritual hut, but the site is also protected by the Council of Elders of Niagasola, led by the chief of the clan. On request of the Kuyati family to protect the site, the Heritage Division of the State of Guinea is considering setting up a museum of the Sosobala. And in the meantime, the state has agreed to provide the initial funding. Important to note in this case is that responsibility rather than ownership is emphasized. And that is something new. We think in terms, typically Western thought and so on, of ownership. And here it's rather about responsibility. I think it's a shift in emphasis. Hence one is inclined to agree with Deacon et al. that ownership over heritage is both a philosophically problematic, uh, is both philosophically problematic and difficult to prove. As in this case, ownership vests in the clan, but it can also vest in the community. In fact, other case studies show that the community as a whole often takes responsibility for the protection of built heritage. By extension, this issue of ownership also applies to, to, to traditional knowledge. In some countries, there have been politically driven attempts of homogenizing indigenous identity according to which individual groups are subsumed into the nation's whole. This is to be achieved in a climate of authorial and cultural disposition. In this regard, our dear Sabine Marshall here describes how the South African government in an attempt to forge national identity within its paradigm of a rainbow nation in post-apartheid South, post South Africa, recommended that each of the nine provinces identify and focus on what was significant and unique to it. In the case of the KwaZulu-Natal KZN province, this resulted in a repositioning of the province as the Zulu Kingdom, which was characterized by a focus on Zulu heritage and cultural identity, and most prominently, the use of symbols relating to the Zulu monarchy and traditional Zulu culture. In the process, a stereotyped construction of Zulu identity was achieved, which might have had a positive empowering effect on local communities in KZN, since it raised their sense of self-esteem, but on the other hand, was counterproductive, <laughs> since it did not promote the national vision of nation building as expressed in its rainbow, rainbow nation paradigm and slogan of Simunye, we are one. According to Marshall, reconciliation and nation building requires refraining from establishing national heritage developments that may be perceived as confrontational and divisive. This implies that the emphasis should be on a shared past. I think this sentence is important. This implies that the emphasis should be on a shared past, but at the same time accommodate differences in cultural heritages and identity within the paradigm of the Rainbow Nation. I think this is also applicable to other situations. This implies that cultural autonomy of different cultural groups has to be acknowledged if intangible cultural heritage is to protect it in South Africa and by extension also the rest of Africa. This would be prepare the stage for negotiations with individual cultural groups to formally recognize and secure indigenous heritage traditional knowledge, intellectual and cultural property rights on terms set by themselves. Heritage management as we know it was introduced into Africa 
during the colonial era and was based on a monumental understanding of cultural heritage. Heritage was regarded as predominantly of scientific value and interest only. Together with political processes in particularly sub-Sahara Africa, um, people have been alienated from their cultural heritage. In the process, places of particular significance to the local peoples were ignored, with the result that significant cultural heritage sites with outstanding values have been lost or are today in a state of serious decay. Likewise, traditional knowledge regarding traditional maintenance and conservation practices were not recognized, which resulted in their neglect by local populations in many African countries. Fortunately, there are still communities all over the continent that have endeavored to conserve their heritage despite the turbulences of the past. And I'm going to discuss it under a few subheadings. The first one under the heading of traditional management of built heritage. As indicated above previously, traditional knowledge is holistic, relational, and spiritual. This also means that all aspects of the universe, the biophysical, the social and spiritual dimensions are interrelated. This principle reveals itself also in the management of built heritage. Timlich Oinga is a world heritage site situated in the Nyanza province of Kenya. The history of the site goes back 500 years ago. Archaeological research revealed that Timlich Oinga site was embedded within a complex social system of behavior with associated religious beliefs and practices, uh, as well as a political system that defined society. This led to rules, prohibitions, and taboos that ensured the well-being of the site. Of particular significance is that conservation management was apparently not executed within a typical hierarchical order but rather in a hierarchical fashion, which meant that information was quickly and horizontally relayed, leading to appropriate responses such as assessing the conservation needs, gathering re relevant expertise, labor and resources, and eventually executing the task. In the case of Timlich Oinga, limiting bureaucratic behavior in information management and conservation procedures created an efficient way of maintaining the site complex. With regard to the importance of community involvement in the conservation of people's cultural heritage, Blake comments that it deepens the political dimension since it provides opportunities to democratize the process by which we give value to heritage, giving a larger role to local people, especially in the developing world. In this respect, Buenzai provides a model based on democratic and traditional principles for the management of community-owned nature reserve in the Limpopo province of South Africa, which can also be applied for heritage management. And that is too detailed to discuss here, but I have to mention it in terms of this whole quest for combining uh, the principles of democracy with traditional practices of appointment, usually. Um, second point, making the tangible, tangible, the intangible, the importance of rituals and ceremonies to conserve built heritage. Uh, this is one line that goes through all these conservation practices, uh, that it's actually being upheld by, by uh, rituals and ceremonies. Above, it was then indicated that rituals and ceremonies form part of intangible cultural heritage and that intangible heritage gives meaning to and support tangible heritage. By extension, rituals and ceremonies contribute towards conserving built heritage. So important is the role of ritual in the conservation of built heritage that it almost justifies to consider the notion of what I would like to, to call ritual knowledge. The question is, are rituals tangible heritage. They seem to bridge tangible and intangible in that they are based on living memory and thus people. Hence I argue again that people are the best monuments for tangible heritage and as such we should preserve them first with what it implies. 
Second one, the Temple of Aru in the northeast uh, of Mali is a revered place of history, worship and power for the Dogon people. For centuries, the temple has been the object of annual conservation work during the annual ceremonies and rituals linked to the festival of the Bulo, that is a seed time festival, which reunites all descendants of the Aru clan. The maintenance of the temple through the Bulo clearly illustrates the inextricable entwinement of tangible and intangible heritage. The cultural mission of Bandi Agara encourages the perpetuation of these social and religious traditions since it is believed that they are the reasons why community members share communal responsibility for the general conservation of cultural heritage. Likewise, the importance of rituals in the conservation of built heritage is illustrated in the case of Kamablon, a sacred house in Mali, due to the septennial repair work using traditional techniques that are still applied today, the Kamablon is in a good state of conservation. On this occasion of reparation, the history of the region, its values, world views, beliefs and traditions are narrated with reference to genealogical records. A last example concerns the South African landscape where Freedom Park was erected. Freedom Park can be regarded as a reinterpretation of Africanization in the sense that it is a modern structure which attempts to articulate an African identity while at the same time affirming its connectedness to European tradition and to the rest of the world. Its Africanist appeal lies most probably in the intangible spiritual values attached to it. A stone can at this site is namely deeply imbued with spirituality since sacred rituals are performed um, to lay the spirits of the fallen heroes and heroines of the liberation struggle. Although any knowledge system is based on intelligence, it seems to be treated as a matter of course since it is very seldom considered or appreciated in a conscious way when knowledge systems are discussed. However, the intelligence reflected in the construction and maintenance of inter alia built heritage is sometimes so impressive that it just cannot be ignored but deserves attention. The Muscom huts in the far north of Cameroon, which have been famous since the 19th century, serve as an excellent example of the intelligence and traditional knowledge that goes into the erection conservation of built heritage. Guys, in the design of these huts, uh, also the material being used and so on. There is so much traditional knowledge combined, of course, with intelligence that goes into it. Uh, it's a pity that I haven't got the time, actually, also just to, to go into that detail. But a uh, thing that I would like to mention here is that women were in charge of the maintenance. This thing is also a dying art. When necessary, they applied a protective sealant coating just before the rainy season began. The technical and organizational aspects of the hut shell conservation were perfectly controlled and integrated into the physical and socio-cultural context of the region. It is a lesson in architecture which facilitates the aesthetic values of the people but with full respect for the environment. All these consider considerations facilitate conservation. And, uh, another point, uh, conservation by training practices. Um, am I still where I am supposed to be? Uh, yeah. The sustainability of built heritage also depends on the way in which succeeding generations are trained to acquire the traditional knowledge and skills necessary for the conservation of immovable heritage. In 1997, the Department of Antiquities and Museums, in conjunction with the Kingdom Administration, nominated the above-mentioned Kasubi tombs um, in Uganda for World Heritage status. In 1998, a mission was organized to train people directly involved in the conservation and management of the site. And as part of the nomination process, a management plan was developed to coordinate efforts of all stakeholders stabilize the state of conservation of the site, revive the living traditions, and improve its presentation to the public. This led to the Buganda Tomb Site Committee with eight members, including members of the royal family. The composition is interesting and of significance. 
royal family, the Bugana minister in charge of tourism and heritage, custodians of the Kasubi tombs, a member of the Ngeye clan, an architect, and an engineer. This committee, appointed by the, the Katikiru, was formed to work on all the cultural heritage sites in the kingdom and is responsible for their conservation and man management. <laughs> of significance is that there has been a change in the management practices of conservation professionals in Uganda. They now work with traditionalists to respect the norms and values of the site. And then the well-known Timbuktu and so on, almost the same uh, message uh, is ga actually gathered from this example, but due to a time constraint, I'm just going to leave it there. Something then about South Africa specifically, seeing that I'm from there. The National Heritage Resources Act, and I'm also going to be very brief in terms of this act, makes provision for the protection of built as well as intangible heritage, which is in accordance with international trends. Of particular importance to this study is that Section 7 of the Act stipulates that in the identification, assessment, and management of the resources of South Africa, and then I quote, all relevant cultural values and indigenous knowledge systems must be taken into account, which is very nice. It sounds very nice. The question is, the extent to which the additional knowledge has been in taken into consideration in the identification, assessment, and management of heritage resources is questionable. The education and training of people at local level is the responsibility of the different provincial governments in South Africa. It's common knowledge that officials at this level are not adequately trained. To complicate matters further, they are not necessarily members of the communities within the areas of jurisdiction uh, of the local authorities, which means that they are not necessarily acquainted with the places, cultural values, beliefs, and practices of the communities. This is also the situation in many other uh, countries in Africa, according to MUMA 2005. Despite these complexities, it becomes the responsibilities of the local authorities to pro provide the necessary education and training to community members to empower them um, to participate effectively in the identification and management of heritage. Their traditional knowledge is indispensable if we are serious about the protection and sustainability of cultural heritage. Likewise, other stakeholders have to be made aware that, the commu that community members have invaluable traditional knowledge without which the effective identification and management of cultural heritage are not viable. Since heritage is created every day, a last word should be said about the recent tendency in South Africa to establish new sites related to the past. Newly declared sites are more contemporary and political in nature, since they are often associated with the liberation struggle and the recent transformation in South Africa. The focus is rather on the intangible heritage, which requires new measures for heritage conservation. What is, what is significant is that not communities, but rather heritage agencies, such as SARA, are mandated to formulate and coordinate policy on the transformation and management of heritage resources. This provides the opportunity for political adjustments. Of significance was SARA's annual report that described the aim of the survey project, among other things, as to conserve the heritage of communities, define national cultural, uh, to define national cultural identity, affirm cultural diversity, shape national character, and build our nation. There are clear contradictions regarding the aim of this project, in my opinion. Firstly, since the conservation of heritage has been politicized, on whose terms will the heritage of communities be identified and conserved? Secondly, the heritage of communities has to be conserved and the cultural diversity be affirmed. But at the same time, national cultural identity and nation building have to be promoted and defined. And maybe one can bring in again the removal of the Rhodes statue and also those of other political figures of the colonial and apartheid era, Paul Kruger, Verwoerd, etc. And uh, those talk directly to the ways in which tangible heritage is constructed in a multiplicity of ways. The new monuments, of which Freedom Park is a prime example, endorse new perspectives on a contested past. In the case of old monuments, there are often reinterpretations of past events, and new meanings are attached to them. 
In the latter regard, the Battle of Blood River and the Fort Tracker Monument serve as examples. I'm going to leave it there, coming to the conclusion and some recommendations. The first point to raise is that the notion of traditional knowledge is highly problematic. In addition, the notion of tangible heritage is a Western construct. Tangible heritage is determined by the intangible meaning attached to it. As such, tangible heritage is a state of mind, which implies that people are in fact the best monuments for tangible heritage and should be preserved first. The examples that are given in, under the previous section provide an indication of the variety of traditional conservation practices. The examples highlight the high level of conservation skills that were developed over centuries. In the process, the importance of protecting the intangible cultural heritage as a prerequisite for conserving and, sustainable, uh, and sustaining the intangible built heritage has been emphasized. There are indications, however, that the younger generations are becoming reluctant in conserving their cultural heritage. Um, it has become, uh, also Joffrey uh, says it, uh, to, uh, that it has become difficult to mobilize the community with the result that there is now a need to pay for the services of skilled artisans as well as their transport. These changes will eventually raise questions of authenticity in the medium and long term. <coughs> The answer will largely be determined by an ahistorical or a historical approach. This means that it has become important for professionals in the field of cultural heritage management and conservation to be integrated into the development of conservation strategies. A particular example of such an achievement is Uganda. The Buganda Tombs Site Committee, which includes the Royal Family, the Minister of Tourism and Heritage, the custodian of the tombs, a clan member, an architect, and an engineer, serves to illustrate the point and there are also other cases, I'm just going to leave it there for now, of particular importance is the transfer of traditional knowledge and skills, which will involve not only technical knowledge and practices, but also intangible spiritual values. For instance, the cultural mission of Bandiagara encourages the perpetuation of social and religious traditions because they believe that they are the reasons why community members share communal responsibility for the general conservation of cultural heritage. However, it's the opinion that more should be done than just to encourage the perpetuation of particular cultural practices to conserve heritage. Very few African countries have legislation that provides for the protection of living cultural practices, living cultural practices, intangible heritage and cultural landscapes. In this respect, South Africa is certainly one of a few exceptions. However, legislation is no guarantee that built heritage will be protected as the removal of the road statue from UCT's uh, campus has proved. Hence, it is also clear that in a multicultural setup, such as in South Africa, comprehension, toleration, and respect for one another's heritage and symbols must be cultivated. I think that's a point to stress. To conclude, the challenge is to develop institutions that will accommodate professionals and traditional rulers and custodians of cultural heri heritage. On their own, state-based systems are incapable of providing a holistic and sustainable management of local immovable heritage. Such in institutional structures will have to provide a traditional, that is a, an, an appointed component, as well as an elected, that's a de democratic component, at local level in order to create a, a link to regional and national level. I thank you.